Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. The financial system in chaos money news offers the Italian banking system is a leaning tower that truly could completely collapse at literally any moment. And as Italy's banks begin to go down like dominoes, it is going to set off financial panic all over Europe unlike anything we have ever seen before. I wrote about the troubles in Italy back in January, but since that time the crisis has escalated. At this point, Italian banking stocks have declined a whopping 28% since the beginning of 2016, and when you look at some of the biggest Italian banks the numbers become even more frightening. On Monday, shares of Monte dei Paschi were down 4.7%, and they have now plummeted 56% since the start of the year. Shares of Carage were down 8%, and they have now plunged a total of 58% since the start of the year. This is what a financial crisis looks like, and just like we are seeing in South America, the problems in Italy appear to be significantly accelerating. So what makes Italy so important? Well, we all saw how difficult it was for the rest of Europe to come up with a plan to rescue Greece. But Greece is relatively small. They only have the 44th largest economy in the world. The Italian economy is far larger. Italy has the 8th largest economy in the world, and their government debt to GDP ratio is currently sitting at about 132%. There is no way that Europe has the resources or the ability to handle a full meltdown of the Italian financial system. Unfortunately, that is precisely what is happening. Italian banks are absolutely drowning in non-performing loans, and as Jeffrey Moore has noted, this potentially represents the greatest threat to the world's already burdened financial system. Shares of Italy's largest financial institutions have plummeted in the opening months of 2016 as piles of bad debt on their balance sheets become too high to ignore. Amid all of the risks facing EU members in 2016, the risk of contagion from Italy's troubled banks poses the greatest threat to the world's already burdened financial system. At the core of the issue is the concerning level of non-performing loans NPLs, on banks' books, with estimates ranging from 17% to 21% of total lending. This amounts to approximately 200 billion euros of NPLs, or 12% of Italy's GDP. Moreover, in some cases, bad loans make up an alarming 30% of individual banks' balance sheets. Things have already gotten so bad that the European Central Bank is now monitoring liquidity levels at Monte dei Paschi and Carage on a daily basis. The following comes from Reuters. Money News offers the European Central Bank is checking liquidity levels at a number of Italian banks, including Banca Carage and Monte dei Paschi di Siena, on a daily basis, two sources close to the matter said on Monday. Italian banking shares have fallen sharply since the start of the year amid market concerns about some 360 billion euros of bad loans on their books and weak capital levels. The ECB has been putting pressure on several Italian banks to improve their capital position. The regulator can decide to monitor liquidity levels at any bank it supervises on a weekly or daily basis if it has any concern about deposits or funding. A run on the big Italian banks has already begun. Italians have already been quietly pulling billions of euros out of the banking system, and if these banks continue to crumble this stealth run could quickly become a stampede. And of course panic in Italy would quickly spread to other financially troubled members of the Eurozone such as Spain, Portugal, 
Greece and France. Here is some additional analysis from Jeffrey Moore. A deteriorating financial crisis in Italy could risk repercussions across the EU exponentially greater than those spurred by Greece. The ripple effects of market turmoil and the potential for dangerous precedents being set by EU authorities in panicked response to that turmoil could ignite yet more latent financial vulnerabilities in fragile EU members such as Spain and Portugal. Unfortunately, most Americans are completely blinded to what is going on in the rest of the world because stocks in the US have had a really good run for the past couple of weeks. Headlines are declaring that the risk of a new recession has passed and that the crisis is over. Meanwhile, South America is plunging into a full-blown depression, the Italian banking system is melting down, global manufacturing numbers are the worst that we have seen since the last recession, and global trade is absolutely imploding. Other than that, things are pretty good. Seriously? It is absolutely critical that we don't allow ourselves to be fooled by every little wave of momentum in the stock market. It is a fact that sales and profits for U.S. corporations are declining. This is a trend that began all the way back in mid-2014 and that has accelerated during the early stages of 2016. The following comes from Wolf Richter. Money News offers total U.S. business sales, not just sales by S&P 500 companies but also sales by small caps and all other businesses, even those that are not publicly traded, peaked in July 2014 at $1.365 trillion, according to the Census Bureau. By December 2015, total business sales were down 4.6% from that peak. About 18 months for sales. They're back where they'd first been in January 2013. Sales by S&P 500 companies dropped 3.8% in 2015, according to FactSet, the worst year since the financial crisis. I know that a lot of people have been eagerly anticipating a complete and total global economic collapse for a long time, and many of them just want to get it over with. Well. The truth is that nobody should want to see what is coming. Personally, I rejoice for every extra day, week or month we are given. Every extra day is another day to prepare, and every extra day is another day to enjoy the extremely comfortable standard of living that our debt-fueled prosperity has produced for us. Most Americans have absolutely no idea how spoiled we really are. Even just 50 years ago, Life was so much harder in this country. If we had to go back and live the way that Americans did 100 or 150 years ago, there are very few of us that would be able to successfully do that. So enjoy the remaining days of that fueled prosperity while you still can, because great change is coming, and it is going to be extremely bitter for most of the population. Money News Presented
King World News. I'm Eric King, and you're about to hear a tremendous interview from Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. Remember to go to our homepage. We're on Sunday. We will have a special release with one of the top money managers in the world discussing gold, silver, major markets, and much more. But without any further delay, here is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. Joining us now is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. He's the former assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury and former associate editor and columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Roberts, you would seen the quote on King World News that we put out from William McChesney Martin, the longest serving chairman of the Federal Reserve, serving under five presidents from Truman to Nixon. Quote, but a note should be made here that while money policy can do a great deal, it is by no means all powerful. In other words, we should not place too heavy a burden on monetary policy. It must be accompanied by appropriate fiscal and budgetary measures if we are to achieve our aim of stable progress. If we ask too much of monetary policy, we will not only fail, but we will also discredit this useful and indeed indispensable tool for shaping our economic development. When you contrast that to what we're seeing today, have they abused it to the point where that warning wasn't heeded and we're headed for trouble? There's really no no comparison between his time and our time today. Monetary stimulation stimulates production in other countries, such as China, where, for example, all of Apple computers' products are made. And so <clears throat> monetary stimulation today puts the Chinese back to work and the Indians and the Indonesians, that is, U.S. monetary policy. So there's not anything comparable to the economy that William McChesney Martin oversaw. Today, the Federal Reserve's policy is focused on saving a handful of very large banks, uh, both American banks uh, and uh, British and European banks. Uh, These are very huge conglomerates that financial deregulation permitted to uh, become such extraordinary concentration that they're just massive institutions. And the belief is that if one of them were to fail, the consequences would be that the entire financial system would fail. Let me ask you this. What do you expect for the balance of 2016? Well, I don't think the House of Cards will make it through the year, but I've been surprised so far because the Federal Reserve, in conjunction with the U.S. Treasury, no longer seems to be limited by what would have been considered proper policy, integrity. You know, the New York Fed has a trading desk. It's as big as any in the world. They can trade anything, not just bonds, stocks, commodities, currencies. And since the Federal Reserve can create money at will, I mean, endless amounts, they can intervene in any markets and create whatever money they need to support those markets. And so as long as they have the impression of a good stock market, in a good bond market, they can keep the impression going that we have a good economy, even though we have 23% unemployment. So as long as the Fed can support the financial markets and keep them from collapsing by its own interventions, then the sort of psychological impression that, well, Uh, The economy must be doing good, and I must be out of work just because of my own fault. Nothing to do with policy. It's just I'm just not employable anymore, and that's just my problem because look how good the stock market's doing. And look how low the interest rates are. How can there be any inflation? When I go to the grocery store and find the prices are always higher, I must be dreaming. They couldn't really be higher because the government tells us inflation is zero. So as long as you can keep the image of a strong financial market, you can keep the image that the economy is prospering. As we've said before, the only real limit, in my opinion, on the Fed's ability to support financial markets through money creation is the value of the dollar. When will the continued 
continued growth in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet cause all confidence in the dollar to be lost. Well, I would have thought it would have happened before now, but the Federal Reserve has other methods. For example, it has the European Central Bank doing quantitative easing. It has the Bank of Japan doing quantitative easing. Well, that's the three big currencies, the yen, the euro, the dollar. If they're all printing, then there's no problem with the dollar losing value relative to the other big currencies. And if everybody's printing, it kind of forces all the little countries to do the same thing. Otherwise, their currencies become so valuable as people seek a stable currency that they can't sell anything. You have to remember, it was a few years ago, the Swiss government had to stop the rise in the Swiss bank that was resulting from American QE by stating that all further efforts of currencies to seek refuge in the Swiss franc would be met by printing more francs and that they would not let the franc, Swiss franc go up any higher in value. So all the countries get forced into printing when the big currencies print. Moreover, as my colleague, or co-author, I should say, Dave Kranzler and I, have shown repeatedly the American regulatory authorities permit the bullion banks, the big New York banks that serve as Federal Reserve agents in the gold and silver markets, they are permitted to use uncovered shorts in the bullion future market to drive down the price of gold and silver and to prevent its rise. So if they can prevent gold rising in price in terms of dollars, then they are protecting the dollar from their policy. Just as they protect, protect the dollar from their policy, by having the Japanese and Europeans print their own currencies. So the question is, what could happen that would cause the Federal Reserve to lose control of the ability to manage the value of the dollar? And if nothing can cause that, then the House of Cards can be kept going forever will have a 50% rate of unemployment and a stock market at 20000 So the way the central bank now can manipulate markets and conduct policy for the benefit of the markets, not for the benefit of the employment or real incomes of the population, this means a failing and economy that's hollowing out producing all kinds of social dislocation, hardship, can be presented as a success because stock prices are high, bond prices are high, interest rates are low. So I don't know what can cause them to lose control of the dollar. And we see increasingly agreements like these various transnational, trans-Pacific transatlantic partnerships where it looks like Washington is organizing the world against the dissident BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, India, China, Russia, South Africa, because these are the countries that say we're withdrawing from this Western monetary system, this Western payment system. We're going to operate independently, well, I think Washington is doing its best to neutralize that independence, if it's, if it's successful, from having any adverse effects. But if there were a run on the dollar and 
And there was massive dumping everywhere of dollars, and nobody, nobody outside of the United States, for example, would hold dollar-denominated assets. Then the dollar would collapse, and the Fed would lose control of policy. If the dollar collapses, American power goes with it. And so a dollar collapse would probably cause the Federal Reserve to let the banks go and raise interest rates substantially, hoping to encourage other countries to continue holding the dollar. Dr. Roberts, we're going to cover gold in just a minute, but right now King World News has a special running with BitGold where King World News listeners can earn a 5% deposit bonus up to $100. What that means is they can deposit $2,000 into their account and instantly be credited with $2,100 of gold. You can take advantage of the special offer by emailing alexander at bitgold.com. That's A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R at bitgold.com. BitGold is revolutionizing the world, and you can become part of that revolution by opening your account today at BitGold.com. Dr. Roberts, we've seen gold rally this year, and it's put in a good move to the upside. We're having a pullback, obviously, here on Friday, but your thoughts on gold and where it's headed from here? Well, Eric, people are buying gold continuously, but the price of gold is not determined in the market where they're buying it. It's determined in the paper futures market, and that market can be manipulated by the creation of paper futures contracts. So the way the whole market is set up is for manipulation of the price. What do we know? We know that the demand for bullion is very high and it's been growing. There have been periods all during this time when both the Canadian and the U.S. mints have had to either suspend sale of one-ounce coins or ration the coins because they can't get the bullion to print enough coins. So we have clearly high demand. We clearly have supply constraints. So how could the price be falling? It falls because of the paper manipulation. And we've talked about this before. David Kranzler and I have illustrated over and over. We've shown the actual real-time manipulations, how all of a sudden the price would go, whoop, drops through the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning (laughs) when nothing has happened (laughs) to cause anybody to flee go. We've shown this over and over and over. So there's no such thing as a pullback and a rally. There's a constant demand for gold that's been rising and for silver and it's apparently not always easy to meet when the Canadian and American mints have to call timeouts because they can't supply the coins and yet the price falls it's clearly manipulation it's manipulation that's approved if not initiated by the authorities. I think I've told you before that I wrote a letter to the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation. I said, look, this is clear manipulation. There's no other explanation. If you have one, please tell me what it is. Why do you turn a blind eye to this illegality? I didn't get a reply. The former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, I didn't get a reply not even an acknowledgement. So if the authorities are complicit in rigging markets, you can't expect anyone to know what the outcome of all this will be. And you have to ask yourself, why does the New York Fed have a trading desk that it allows it to intervene in any market? Currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds. You know, it's very easy. Suppose the stock market's trying to to correct, and it's falling. All the Federal Reserve has to do is go in and buy standard and poor futures. That reverses the fall. And you have to keep in mind, there's no limit on the financial ability of the Federal Reserve. They can create endless amounts of dollars. So if you have the authorities 
committed to maintaining the image of a successful economy because of sustained stock and bond prices, then you've got a rigged economy. In closing, what is the great danger facing the world today? A nuclear war, because the neoconservative drive for world hegemony, which, of course, is supported by the big banks, because they have a drive for world financial hegemony, is supported by the military security complex because it's good for their profits power. It's supported by the oil companies because it's good for their dominance. So if you have this drive for world hegemony and you're confronted with Russia and China, Iran on a regional basis, and Syria, and you can't exercise this hegemony because these countries are in the way, then you focus on destabilizing those countries. That's what all the trouble in Syria is about. That's what all of the setup of Iran for attack was about. You may remember old weapons, uh, nuclear weapons in Iran, nuclear weapons. Uh, all this was to set them up for attack, just as Syria was set up. And, of course, the Russians and Chinese have stepped in to prevent that because they finally caught on, but they were next. Well, if you're going to try to destabilize Russia and China, as we're trying to do, that's what the Ukraine coup was about. You know, we, we organized the coup in Ukraine and throughout the elected government and stuck in our puppets and began having them attack the Russian provinces of Ukraine, resulting in them leaving, and one of them reuniting with Russia, Crimea. If, if you're going to go to the length of trying to destabilize Russia and China, here you're dealing with very powerful countries, with powerful militaries, with powerful nuclear forces. And unless they're just willing to surrender, which we see no evidence of, the result's going to be war. Because what we're telling them is we will not accept the existence of any country that has an independent foreign policy. So you can give up your independent foreign policy and follow our lead, or we're coming after you. We're going to stay after you. That's the message we keep giving them over and over and over. And they've got the message. And so what do we see? We see them both into massive modernizations of all their nuclear forces. We see developments of all kinds of new weapon systems. Indeed, now the, wep the, the, the Russian weapon systems are superior to ours. Uh, we see the Chinese developing missiles that neutralize aircraft carriers, making them in. Our aircraft carriers now are, are as obsolete as our battleships were in World War II. So all of this is war. And there are no winners from nuclear war. You have to remember that the atomic bombs we dropped on Japan these are minuscule compared to hydrogen bombs. And nuclear war here today is something like 17,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs we dropped on Japan. So it only takes a few of them, and there's nobody left. And we have all these... Uh, war games and all this gaming for how to win a nuclear war. We ha and you get people who start believing that they can win one. And so I think that is the big danger. Of course, it's also a danger that the economic policies in the Western world and the ones that the Western world have imposed on what's called the developing world 
produce very high rates of unemployment, and therefore they produce social instabilities. You know, we already have a 23% rate of unemployment. That's enough for social instability. If, as many expect, uh, the U.S. economy has never recovered from the 2008 downturn and is about to turn down again, that 23% rate is going to go up. So we're also faced with the fact that the focus of Western economic